Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer. I'm the Public Health Officer for Douglas County, and this is another of our COVID conversations recorded today on December 2nd. I'm glad to be joined today by Lee Patterson, the former superintendent at Roseburg Schools, who's going to talk a bit about international travel. Lee, thanks for coming. That's good to be with you, Bob. Thanks for having me. Great. But as always, we use today as an opportunity to give people a briefing on what's happening with COVID uh, around the world, and then also uh, to answer some questions that we've gotten this week along the way. So if you do have questions, you can send them to us at Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org, and our staff will curate those questions, and we'll get to those the next time. So in the world, the number of cases is clearly up again. Uh, we're seeing lots of disease in Europe. Remember, this started in Russia, then moved to Eastern Europe and Central Europe, and now it's pretty much all through Europe where they're having a high number of cases. Almost all the cases they're having in Europe are Delta, uh, and uh, they're having a lot of cases. Now, in many of the countries that have a lot of cases, they're mostly among young people, so they're not having a lot of hospitalizations and deaths, but still far more than we should be having. And this is worrisome because Europe is starting to get cool this time of year and worries us about what's gonna happen in other places. The other big news, and the other big place where the disease is hot now is in South Africa, which has seen a doubling in cases in just one day. So when you see it, uh, when you see that rapid rise, it means that there's clearly something happening. And we think what's happening in South Africa is related to the new Omicron variant, which we'll spend a good amount of time on after we do the geographic briefing. In the US, cases are flat, but it's really hard to know because testing and reporting over a holiday weekend are terrible. And Thanksgiving is the worst because it really is a four day weekend. So for example, we had very few cases over the weekend and then a lot of cases in the last three days, some of which we think are pent up from over the weekend. Some are people who got sick when they traveled. And so it's gonna take us a little while to sort that out, but clearly a lot of cases yesterday, 67 new cases yesterday and over 40 new cases today. So that's a lot of cases. And so we're worried uh, that uh, the, the downturn we saw last week was not real but because of the holiday. Um, when we look in the US, the disease is strong in the, in the Northeast where it's cold, in the upper Midwest where it's cold, in Alaska where it's cold, and then also down in Arizona and New Mexico where it's not cold yet, um, but really most of the cases in the US are above the 40th parallel, uh, which is where it's starting to cool down. Uh, in the US, the number of deaths is still declining, from the huge number of deaths that we had in August, September, and the beginning of October. And that's a good sign, but with an increasing number of cases, we're starting to see a little bit of spike in the number of hospitalizations. And with those, we know that a few weeks later, we may see an increase in the number of deaths. Uh, in Oregon, uh, cases are declining now for about 10 weeks. Although it, when I look in the last week, that we might be flattening out or maybe even slightly increasing. When we look at disease in Oregon, there are no real hot spots. But most of the disease we're seeing is in Deschutes County and in Crook County, uh, places east of the Cascades that have more disease than places west of the Cascades, but still a, a fair number of cases. Nowhere in Oregon is down to the very low case counts of one or two cases per 100,000 that we were at in June and July of this year. In Douglas County, we are incredibly flat at about 30 cases per 100,000 per day since about the third week of September. So for a very long time now, we've been very steady in the number of cases that we've had, and unfortunately steady but high in the number of hospitalizations, ranging from 20 to the low 30s. You remember before this big spike, we never had more than 20 people in the hospital. And now for several months, every day, we've had more than 20 in the hospital. Now the hospital I think is handling this well, and, and uh, is well staffed for this, but those extra people in the hospital really do create a bit of a crunch. And we know that some preventive care, some, prevent, some elective surgeries like hip and knee surgeries are scheduled out further than we would like. Uh, for deaths, we've continued to have a, uh, a, a high number of deaths. We've had, we now have had 290 total deaths, 200 of those coming since August the 1st. So 200 deaths since the 1st of August, really, really a stunning toll. Um, the big news this week is about the uh, Omicron variant. So what we know 
is that this, like all other viruses, mutates. And as an RNA virus, it mutates a little bit more than, than most. Uh, and over the years, then, we've seen a bunch of mutants that have caused a change in the, in the pandemic. So we started off what we, with what we call the ancestral strain. That was a strain that came from China. And there was not much mutation until the summertime when the 614th amino acid had it underwent a switch from the, it was called uh, B614G. And so what happened in that time is the little spikes that were on the, um, on, on the virus in the original forms tended to break off. But with this change in amino acid, it got stronger. And as it got stronger, the, the virus became a little bit more potent and a little bit better able to spread still well treated by the by the uh, uh, previous infection, uh, still uh, and not more dangerous. The alpha was the next one. The alpha was a set of, of about of, of a dozen or so mutations that came up first seen in, in the UK, caused a big spike in the UK and then later in the US, only a little spike here in Douglas County. That one was more contagious yet than the previous forms and uh, was just as serious, not any more serious, but just as serious. Then things were quiet for a few months until the springtime when there was a huge outbreak in India. And that huge outbreak in India was caused by the Delta variant. And Delta turned out to be both more contagious and probably more severe than the previous forms. And that's why we had our huge spike in August, September, in the beginning of October. And when you look, almost all of our cases during that spike or Delta. And still, almost all the cases in Oregon are Delta. Now, Delta has had some subvariants, but they're not very much different from Delta. Now, Delta uh, was a little less well uh, treated by the uh, vaccines. The Regeneron worked a little less well, but still in the same ballpark as the previous forms. So we have been on the lookout for a variant that would change that. And the things that we would worry about of variants is a variant that uh, didn't respond well to previous infection, to vaccine, or to treatment with Regeneron. That would be truly bad because um, it put us back to where we were in 2020, which is pretty awful. And so we've been looking, we've especially been looking in Africa, and we worry that Africa is a place where a variant could develop because for variants to develop, you need widespread disease, which could easily happen in, in, in Africa because there's no there's very low vaccine. In a place where many cases could get un, unfound, and in Africa, they do not have a lot of money to do a lot of testing. And we also worry about variants developing in, in people who are immunosuppressed. And we know that there are many people in Africa who have HIV, which is inadequately or untreated. And those people are absolutely the kind of people in whom variants could develop. So we were not totally shocked when a new variant developed somewhere in Southern Africa, either Botswana or South Africa, and now is spreading. And the reason we're worrying is when you look at the, mute, the mutations that are on this, there are a lot of mutations. And many of the mutations are in the area where the antibodies, which is what helps us to fight the disease, uh, uh, attach. And since there are changes where it attaches, the antibodies may work less well. And those could be antibodies from previous infection. Those could be antibodies from vaccination, or they could be antibodies from the Regeneron. And so we very much worry about that. Now, there's lots we don't know about the Omicron. So when we look at a, when we look at a virus and a mutant, there are three things, three things in particular we want to know about. The first is how contagious is it? We don't know about the contagiousness of this variant because it's so new. You know, with cases doubling in a day in South Africa, that does suggest it's really quite contagious, but we won't really know about this until later. The second is disease severity. So all of the previous variants were, were moderately severe, maybe dealt a little bit more than the others, but they were all in the same ballpark. A, vi a variant which is much more severe is very worrisome because it could lead to more hospitals, hospitalizations and deaths. But sometimes as these variants develop, it's actually less serious with less, um, with less severe illness and less hospitalizations. The severity of this new variant we don't know about. And the reason we don't know about is that it's mostly spread in a college community where there are young people. Most of the young people are not particularly ill. 
But we don't know if that's because this is because the virus, the variant is less serious or just that young people tend not to get very sick. We'll find out in the next few days as we look at hospitalization rates in South Africa. Now, people usually get hospitalized about eight days after they get it. So it usually takes a week or two to tell what's happening. So if we don't, we see a big spike in cases and a week or two goes by and we don't see an increase in hospitalizations, that will suggest that perhaps this is less serious. If we see the number of hospitalizations rapidly rise, then we'll know that this probably is serious. So we don't know. And then the third one is how well is the is the variant controlled by vaccine, previous infection, or the Regeneron? And the answer is we don't know. We have some suspicion that it won't be well controlled, but we don't really know. So we have a lot of work to do in the next few weeks to sort this out. In the meantime, we want to buy some time. And the best way to buy time is to try and decrease travel from those areas. If we look at our cases, almost every time we've had a spike, it started with people who traveled to an area where there was a lot of disease. They came back to Douglas County. They introduced it to a bunch of others, and then it, and then it spread. So the best thing that we can do, I think, as a country is to slow down travel from Africa and for people who travel back to quarantine. So don't come back and go around your regular business because if you come back and go about your regular business, you can spread it to lots of others. So I think we, we er, aired last year and when people came back from China, when they came back from Europe, they weren't required to quarantine. And that I think was a big mistake that I hope we will not repeat this time. So far in the US, we just have two cases, one from a fellow in, in, in California who had traveled to South Africa. The second is a bit more worrisome. It's a, it's a, it's a person from Minnesota who went to a anime convention in New York City. So I've been to a few of these conventions and they're amazing. Thousands of people and crowded about almost everybody in costume. So you don't really know who these other people are other than they were dressed up as, as a certain character. And uh, so th this, this person's trip from Minnesota to New York likely had one or two airport, airport stops where he might've picked up the disease likely things besides the convention, but then thousands of, of contacts at the convention. So this is a worry that that was a super spreader event and that we might see more Omicron through the area. People say, how do you know it's Omicron versus the other? And it's a multi-step process. So uh, you get diagnosed with COVID either by an antigen test or a PCR test. Antigen tests can detect that it, the disease is there, but it can't tell you that it's a variant. With a PCR test, it's a two-step process. The first step says that the virus is there. The second step, which is called sequencing, tells you whether it's the variant. In Oregon, there are at least two places that are doing routine sequencing, one at the University of Oregon, one at the State Public Health Lab. So they're sequencing hundreds of samples a day, and so that if Omicron arrives, we'll know soon after it arrives. We may not find the first case, but we'll know soon after it arrives uh, whether whether uh, Omicron is here. So we go back to Delta. We had people who traveled to, to, to California. We had travel, people traveled to Arkansas, people who traveled from Arizona, all places where we knew Delta was circulating. And when they came back and got sick, we sequenced them and we found that there were six separate introductions of Delta in July. And then our cases really took off at the end of July and the beginning of August. So we're going to be very, 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 very carefully following that. In the meantime, the best thing to do is get our case counts down. And the best way to get our case counts down is to get more people vaccinated. The vaccines still seem to be incredibly effective against the Delta, which is the one that's circulating now. Uh, probably gives you five-fold protection in, in catching the disease and more than tenfold protection in preventing hospitalization, even more than that in preventing death. So when we look at our when we look at our cases in the hospital and our deaths, overwhelmingly those people are unvaccinated. But if you look at the people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s who are dying, they're overwhelmingly vaccinated. So, uh, so the vaccines still really work and they still will really work against the Delta. And we hope to know in the next few weeks how well they work against the, the, the Omicron variant. I think we'll have pretty good data on that soon. The last question that we had is about the new antiviral drug. So the new antiviral drug is called Molnupiravir. Molnupiravir is a drug that interferes with the body's production 
of new viruses. So typically what happens when you get infected with the virus, gets into your body, it gets into a cell, and then when it gets into the cell, it kind of hijacks the, the uh, reproduction mechanism and it tells the cells normal uh, production mechanisms. Instead of making the normal things you make, make me. And so the body reproduces lots of these, um, lots of these viruses. And then when there's enough viruses, it kills the cell. The viruses leave the cell then and then infect other cells. Um, so it's basically, if you imagine that these reproductive mechanisms and cells are like photocopiers, uh, that's kind of how it works. So cell gets in there, it tells the photocopy machine, make a thousand copies of me. Once you get a thousand copies, kill the cell, and then I'll spread to the next cell. So it's a very elegant mechanism for, for viruses. What this drug does is it causes the copies to be imprecise. So it sort of blurs the copies. And many of those copies then, then when they get released out into the cell, can't go ahead and infect other cells and the infection stops. There is some concern about this drug. And the concern is you're basically inducing mutations. And anything that induces mutations is a worry because inducing mutations could in, could make a new variant. So there is a little concern about this new drug, but the advisory panel did recommend its use, and I think it'll be available. The other trouble is it's only 30% effective. We have Regeneron, which for at least for Delta appears to be 70 or 80% effective. So it doesn't exactly make sense that you would use Molnupiravir when Regeneron is available. Now, this may change in the next few months when there's a new drug that they're going to be looking at called Plaxivid. So Plaxivid is a drug made by Pfizer, which works in the typical way that, um, that antiviral drugs work. And there's not a lot of concerns about mutations with that drug. That drug is a five-day treatment used soon after and has about 90% effectiveness. And so that, I think, will be a game changer. I don't think this molnupiravir was going to come out. It's going to make that big a difference. So anyway, those are the questions we have for today. So I wanted to uh, talk with Lee. Lee has Lee's just uh, come back from a great trip. And we were very, very interested to know uh, what kind of precautions were taken by countries and by the cruise line on your cruise. So, so tell us how it was. Well, Thanks for having me, Bob. Uh, th this is uh, uh, real sketchy times, and I take very seriously your cautions about uh, there is there is no such thing as an absolutely safe condition. And uh, we considered that when we planned this trip. We watched the uh, uh, disease circulating in, in Europe and made sure that uh, uh, things were pretty much under control before we booked. Uh, since we've returned, we recognize that the places that we visited are are spiking right now, which is a concern. I hope we didn't have anything to do with that. I don't think it was you guys. I don't either. But uh, Viking took this whole uh, travel uh, situation very seriously. You know, they, they 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 have a lot to lose if if uh, this disease gets out because of their um, irresponsible practice. So. They require every single person who travels on the Viking River or Ocean Cruise to be fully vaccinated. Uh, and all of that uh, data has to be submitted. Our, our uh, first landing in Europe was at, in Barcelona. So Barcelona uh, Health Authority uh, and the Spanish Health Authority control who comes in and under what conditions. Uh, so we had to upload a negative uh, PCR test within 72 hours of flying. And I think as I kind of reported to you, that was a little sketchy because you have to get your test 72 hours before you fly, but then you have to upload your results uh, within 24 hours of flying and not longer. Uh, so we had to have our results back because we got tested on Thursday. We had to have our results on Saturday to, in order to fly on Sunday. It was very touch and go. And we thought, you know, there, there's a lot of money invested in these, in these trips and, uh, you know, if, if the test fell apart or we didn't get our results in time, it would have all been for naught. So that was a nail biting time. But yeah, uh, go ahead, Bob. It is nerve wracking. So where did you get that uh, pre-travel test? Well, we got it at uh, Willamette McKenzie, McKenzie Willamette uh, up in uh, Springfield. And uh, uh, in fact, we searched for a place where we could get results that would be guaranteed in 24 or 48 hours. Um, and, and they didn't uh, in Springfield. They didn't. Re they didn't 
guarantee you that. Uh, so we thought the soonest we could get our results back would be Friday. Uh, and it's a PCR, uh, the deep uh, uh, probing Q-tip up in the top of your brain. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it, it was uh, very well handled. It was kind of efficient, except that uh, there were a lot of people in line up there. So it took about an hour and a half, I think, to get uh, sampled. And then uh, we left for home and, and uh, hoped that our doctor's office, because that's you, you can't get the PCR test without a doctor's order. So we got doctor's order from our local um, primary care physician and uh, took that with us to the test site that they required that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of doctor's offices close early on Friday and uh, that was a little scary. <laughs> so we got our results back uh, Friday morning. And because I'd called ahead, uh, the staff at the doctor's office uh, called and said those results were ready. So we went down and pick, picked up uh, the uh, written report and took that with us then too upload to the Spanish Health Authority. But it is a complicated process. And depending upon where you travel, yeah. some places require a certain kind of test or a certain timing of the test. So if people are looking to travel overseas, I would have them absolutely print out what the requirements are before you do it. There's only one place in the state that, um, that does all the tests for all the places and guarantees results in time. And that place is in Portland. And so if you go to uh, PDX Travel, there's a PDX Travel Clinic that uh, has all the equipment to go ahead and do those. It's very expensive. So a mm -hmm. uh, family I knew were five people were traveling. It was over $1,000 and they don't accept insurance. So it was over $1,000 for them to go ahead and get the testing that they needed uh, for, for their travel. So international travel is still a little problematic in getting the test. Well, once you got there, then how did uh, how did Viking assure that uh, if somebody was positive, they didn't spread it to everybody else? Right. Um, it was, uh, um, you know, controlled at every 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 point in the trip uh, was absolutely controlled. Health authorities fully masked. We were fully masked. Uh, we had to have our documents of a negative result, uh, our vaccination card showing uh, evidence that we were fully vaccinated. Uh, and then once we got to Viking, uh, they took all of that information. They took a photograph of your face right there at the terminal. And then that became uh, your face recognition for the rest of the trip. Because at every restaurant we visited, we had to stand in front of the, um, a, a teleprompter uh, that had a dotted line in which you inserted your face. And then it recognized who you were. So highly, your temperature is 36.2 Celsius. Uh, Welcome to the restaurant and uh, very well, tightly controlled uh, on the gangway going into the ship. Uh, we were all issued uh, a contact tracing medallion that we, uh, were, we, we were obligated to wear 24 seven, except when you're in your stateroom. Uh, and uh, that was kind of an ingenious device that I had not, not I didn't know the technology, but what it does is it tracks your movement. Uh, and if anybody ever is uh, does test positive, uh, there's a record of uh, the people with whom that, that positive uh, um, infection has had any kind of contact with. And so, uh, and, and we didn't hear of any, and I, that didn't, of course, wouldn't report that, but uh, we felt pretty confident that uh, there were no infections at all. Well, that's great. So the NFL has used that device over the last season. And so that proximity device looks to see that if you're in contact with somebody for a prolonged period of time, people are really terrible at remembering who they've been around. Right. Uh, you may re you may have forgotten that. Oh yeah, I did have that chat with that lovely fellow from Wisconsin uh, later on, or you may not even know what their name is. These proximity uh, badges do that, and they're really quite effective. Oregon at one time had considered using. There's a phone-based mechanism that does the same thing. So if your cell phone gets within six feet of somebody for 15 minutes. It, it, it can pick up a signal from that other phone. Uh, it never got implemented because people were a little worried about the big brother kind of approach to that. But when you're on a ship like this, it really is very necessary. Well, that big brother's in your pocket if you have a cell, um, cell phone anyway. So. Yeah, I'd be <laughs> worried about that. But, I think he's living in all of our pockets. So that's yeah. good. So, so tell us about the great parts of the trip. Well, it was uh, fantastic. Uh, you know, because uh, of COVID, 
and the, the company's concern about uh, the disease. Uh, we, we were, uh, there were 400 plus passengers on the ship that normally has capacity of over 900. Uh, all of the venues were 50% uh, occupied and uh, no um, traditional kind of entertainment, dancing and that kind of thing. And so we, we, we maintained distance, wore a mask whenever we were outside of our stateroom. And because of that, we were al allowed to go in small groups of eight, nine people with a guide onto uh, shore to see Monte Carlo and uh, um, in the area around Nice uh, in Italy, at Florence and Rome. Um, we just traveled the whole country and, and went around the, uh, the, the boot of Italy up into Greece and then Croatia and then uh, to Venice and home. And wow. I think we missed out on a lot because we weren't allowed to mingle with the local folks, uh, which was, you know, a good precaution, I think. But uh, and every morning, uh, um, Bob, I, I, I thought this was uh, very unusual. And I was surprised to find out that on board the Viking uh, cruise ship, there is a full PCR lab with the right. scientists who are monitoring every single passenger. Every morning when we woke up, there was a, a vial for Robin and one for me in our stateroom. And it was printed out and had a barcode on it. And before we were even allowed to brush our teeth, we had to submit a saliva sample. And it reminded me so much of uh, your wish for Christmas. I think it was last year. Yeah, you get it. Have a test like that, and so right. we did every day. So that so for people who've been watching this over time for last Christmas, what I hoped for was a daily test. And the daily test is you'd spit this before you took a shower. And by the time you got done, you'd get the result. This is obviously what you described is a lot more complicated because it had to go down to the lab and be run through the PCR. But there's ways to do it with antigen tests. And we still need to get to a point where you could easily, easily do that. Mm -hmm. So were the, the, in, in the places you went to in Europe were low incidents at the time. I was sort of following them day by day. They've come up a little bit, but Portugal which has a very high vaccine rate and has been pretty strict on the precautions has probably done about the best of any place in Europe. Mm -hmm. Italy was very tightly controlled. Uh, they would, they would not allow um, anybody that wasn't supervised uh, into the country to walk around. Wow. Greece and Croatia were a little looser. And I note now with following uh, spikes around the world that Greece and Croatia are paying a little bit of a penalty for that. So, right. so there is a balance between control and the amount of disease. Uh, and some countries have chosen a lower rate of disease and more control. So for example, New Zealand, which relies heavily on international travel is still closed to international travel, which has really hurt their tourism industry, but they've had very, very, very few uh, new cases. So mm -hmm. well, good. So would you do it again? You've done it. You were there. If well, there was another opportunity to have a trip, would you do it? I would. I would do it exactly like we did it. I would make sure that there wasn't a lot of disease in our potential um, destinations and uh, take every precaution and follow every direction that they suggested. We had to also answer a daily questionnaire on our television set. They were, they were making sure that nobody on their ship got sick because of their lax practice. Well, so for people who've been following the pandemic, the early cases were really on ships. So the Ruby Princess and the Diamond Princess were two areas where there were a lot of cases. In fact, some of the cases, our first cases, were people who were on cruise ships. And it was felt that if people felt that they would go on a cruise and get sick from COVID, they wouldn't want to go because most of the people going on cruises are older and thus at higher risk for a bad outcome from, from COVID. Uh, the, the cruise ships learned a little bit about this about uh, 15 years ago when norovirus started to erupt on cruise ships. And norovirus, which is this uh, this gastrointestinal virus with a very short incubation period that gives you really awful vomiting and diarrhea really would be terrible. It would get on a cruise ship, would spread then to many people on the cruise ship, and you'd have a lot of uh, people with vomiting and diarrhea, and they would be really unhappy. So the cruise ships have done a great job in reducing the amount of norovirus. And I think what they learned from that has helped them to keep cruises safe in the time of COVID. So good. Well, hopefully you'll do another trip. And yep. uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Sounds like that is a fabulous trip. It was fun. It was a lot of fun, Bob. Appreciate your advice on that too. Well, great. So, uh, so we do give try. So if people do have travel advice. You can send that to us at Facebook questions at DouglasPublicHealthNetwork.org. 
what again what you need to do is you need to find out specifically where you're going because the difference between one country and another can be remarkably different mm -hmm. and so you do need to know specifically but we can try and help people get the testing and the stuff they need beforehand so okay. to finish off there are just a couple of things one is that boosters are available we now have primary vaccines for everybody five and above and boosters for everybody 18 and above uh, boosters are widely available. There are 30 different places in town that are doing boosters. If you're looking for a booster, uh, there's going to be a um, there's going to be a special event on the fourth at uh, at uh, Cow Creek. They're going to be doing primary shots and booster shots. So if you're looking for a booster and haven't gotten yours yet, uh, I'd certainly encourage people to do that. And again, the a good place this weekend to do that is at the as at the Cow Creek. Uh, the Cow Creek area there. In addition, Aviva is doing them on an everyday basis. Evergreen and Uncle Health uh, Newton Creek are also doing the booster shots. We think the booster shots really help to boost your immunity. What we're seeing now is some cases in nursing homes where people were vaccinated in January and February. Um, some of them are getting sick. Some are getting hospitalized. So, and what we've seen is they're now 10 months out from the vaccine. Really, really, it's a good time to get a booster, especially for those people who are 50 and above with underlying conditions, or for any of us who are 65 and older. So again, uh, this is a good talking to you today. Let's go ahead and do this again. We'll do this again next week. Again, if you have questions, put them at Facebook questions at DouglasPublicHealthNetwork.org, and we'll try to get to them. Or in the meantime, if you have questions, just give us a call. Again, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer. Thank you, Lee, for joining us. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for all you do. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you.